Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. Uh, I'm your host, Marcus Grodi. I have this great opportunity once again. You've been putting up with me for a long time. I appreciate, we always appreciate the kind words we receive from you in emails and how much these uh, uh, accounts of people's journey have been an encouragement to you. Uh, it, it makes it all worth it, so thank you very much. And I always do pray that these stories are an encouragement to you. And I've told my guests many times that this program's not about him or it's not about me. It's about what the Holy Spirit's done in our life and what the Holy Spirit can do in your life as we're open to his grace. And so thank you again for joining us. Our guest tonight is a returning guest. Uh, I think he's been on the Journey Home program more than I've been on the program. Our <laughs> guest is David Curry. He's a former fundamentalist Protestant. He's in many ways mostly known for a book that he once wrote, I think, for his father called mm -hmm. Born Fundamentalist, Born Again Catholic. He was on the journey home, oh, back in 2013, but I think he's been on a bunch more than that. David, my old friend, welcome good, back. Good to be back, good to be back. It's good to see you. It's too bad that the only time we ever are able to get together is when we're across this table. Yeah, we catch up, you know, for about an hour before this, <laughs> and there's so much to catch up on, but it's really good to see you. Really good to see it you. It is, my friend, it's, uh, it's, it's good to see you. And, uh, we've already shared how our lives have changed and our kids have moved on. Uh, I just got my, uh, I had my sixth grandchild, uh, but I didn't have as much to do with that as my son, John Mark, and his wife, Teresa, and, and, and my wife, Marilyn. But, uh, and you've got how many grandkids? Now? Well, we, we had eight children, and uh, our youngest girl is right now expecting our 24th grandchild. So God has been very generous to our family. Um, <laughs> You know, they, the, the kids ta are taking bets on where we're going to finally end up. You know, they're saying probably somewhere between 40 and 50. So, you know, uh, I, I was thinking uh, not long ago that in my life, um, yeah, it's almost 50 years ago, by the mercy of God's grace, he opened my heart to Jesus. And then by the mercy of his grace, I said yes. And now I look back on how many things have happened as a result of that willingness to follow grace. My children, my marriage, you know, the ministry, all that. And I bet you could say the same thing, my friend. Yes, and uh, I just want to emphasize what you just said about grace. That is so true. Um, we are saved by grace. We're saved by grace. It's the, God, without God's grace, none of us would, would make that initial. Uh, decisions to follow Christ. Now, mine was when I was just only about six or seven. You know, I was a, a preacher's kid in a rather large fundamentalist church. Um, at six or seven, I, I realized, hey, I wanted to go to heaven. You know, I want, <laughs> the alternative I wasn't excited about, and uh, and I wanted to love Jesus. I, I never, I don't really remember ever not loving Jesus. Um, I got baptized when I was about 13 because we didn't baptize children uh, in the fundamentalist uh, uh, group that I was in. And to be honest with you, I didn't realize until I became a Catholic years and years later that from that moment of my baptism, I never questioned whether God loved me. I never ever again questioned whether I was a child of God. I never once ever questioned the fact that I had this filial relationship with God. And before that, from six to 13, I was, I was agonizing over, you know, did God really love me? Did I really love God enough, you know? Um, you know, it reminds me this morning, I just happened to be reading in uh, uh, a, a wonderful book called Three Ways of the Spiritual Life by Father Gary Lagrange, And I just happened mm. to glance through, I'd read the book many times. And he said there in answer to what is grace, he makes a statement that it, it, it's a foretaste of heaven. It's a little bit of the eternal life that we receive now. So now it's, we get a hunger in our heart because we get a foretaste of it. That's just what you talked about. Yeah, no, no, exactly. It, and, you got that grace. Now you never gave up on, on God loving you because you had the fort. Now it's a, it's a drawing. It's a tug. Right. And I didn't in. realize it at the time. I was baptized, total immersion, by my father, in front of the church, <laughs> in a fundamentalist church. For me, I realized now it was a sacrament. And the church 
when I came into the church, said, no, no, we're not going to rebaptize you, David. You were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit with water. You were baptized. That's a sacrament. You were you yeah. sacramentally baptized. And, um, and that's when I got thinking about the fact that at that point, there really was a change in me. I didn't yeah. feel like it when I came out of the water, and I didn't really think about it when I was a teenager. But I never, ever yeah. doubted that God loved me after that moment. And so, you know, the sacrament worked, even though I didn't know that it was a sacrament. Um, yeah, makes me... Uh, Saint John Henry, Cardinal Newman, used to mention in his books one of his impetus to reach out to his separated brothers and sisters because he did not want them to miss this moment of grace. He didn't want to miss this moment of grace. So the beauty of that is God extends his grace, but we're still free to respond. Right? We're still free to respond. We can turn away. What you just witnessed to is that when God reached out that grace to you, you responded by grace. I mean, praise God. Praise God. Saying. Praise God. I don't, take, I don't take credit for it. I mean, God, God was, has been good to me my whole life, you know. Um, so from 13 on, I, I, was, uh, I, I didn't remember anything that I ever wanted to be other than be a fundamentalist missionary minister, something along that line. I don't ever remember any other goal in high school. You know, uh, I was all in, you know, so I, uh, I went to Bible school, then I went to uh, uh, Trinity Evangelical right. Divinity School after I went to Trinity College. Um, about that time, I became a, a missionary, fundamentalist missionary here on college campuses in the United States. And, uh, and I was, I, I, I had no doubt I was a Christian, you know, and I never thought about the Catholic Church at all. <laughs> it just wasn't even on my radar yeah, screen, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that happened to me after I became baptized, uh, you know, this book right here, as a fundamentalist, this was, this was everything, yeah. the Bible. Yeah. Um, but I started to find verses in the Bible that I couldn't explain. And I'll never forget, I was about 13 or 14, the president of Dallas Theological Seminary happened to be over our house for dinner. And I had had a question that I'd asked my dad the week before about Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. And he said, you know what? Dr. Walford's going to be here this Sunday. Why don't you ask him that question? But that's what my yeah. teenage years were like. Hmm. I was very, very interested in finding out. Um, and, and at Trinity Seminary, particularly, I found that there were there were a lot of verses I couldn't explain. I just yeah. couldn't explain. We just them. made a conundrum for the audience because there's some people back there wondering, well, Colossians, what? Oh, uh, 120. <laughs> should I read I mean, that? Hopefully, they're, they're running their Bibles. They're running uh, their Bible. Because they're just at least wondering what was this verse that. Uh, yeah, this is the first verse I remember thinking, I can't explain this verse. You know? Um, and Paul is speaking and he's writing to his, you know, the church in Colossae. Uh, now I rejoice in my sufferings which is Paul. I rejoice that I suffered for your sake. And in, here's the part that bothered me, in my flesh, I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. And I thought, well, well wait a minute. I believe that on the cross, and I still believe, by the way, yeah. that on the cross, an infinite amount of mercy and an infinite amount of grace was, was bestowed on the yeah. world because of Christ's suffering. Totally undeserved, totally willing, um, and as the God-man, totally innocent. So that gained all these graces for me and for you. What's Paul talking about adding to that? How do you add to something that's infinite? And how do you add to something that's complete? In other words, the finished work of Christ was a phrase we used a lot. Um, and that just sort of stuck in the back of my mind for years and years. I went through seminary without ever, ever answering. In fact, I started getting more verses. I, I would say that the other conundrum in that just, is that often fundamentalists don't have a mental file folder for suffering anyway. Right. We, have a very, we had a very um, flat view of, of suffering. 
It wasn't well-rounded. We didn't understand that it could be efficacious, that it could be uh, not just even for me, but my suffering could help you or yeah. your suffering could help me. That wasn't even in our... our uh, and, and, and many fu fundamentals out of your group would have also said that on this side of the cross, a, a believer wouldn't suffer. Yeah, we wouldn't have gone. Some, yeah, we, we wouldn't have gone that far. But many do. Many, many do. do uh, many do. That yeah. that if you're that Christ suffered, so we don't have to. Yeah. And that was a little bit too far into the prosperity gospel for right. us. We really didn't go that far. Plus, it doesn't really fit with right. with reality. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so we wouldn't have gone quite that far. But definitely, there was the suffering that we needed for eternity was done, and we don't have to do anything. Yeah. There's nothing. That didn't fit with what, what Paul was saying. So I, I went all through, you know, all through college, Bible school, got into seminary, was still asking these questions, not on a daily basis, but I never got an answer. You know, uh, the, the question was there. Um, so that was sort of the background. I found, to, to take a long, long, long story <laughs> and shorten it up in a very, very compact statement, I found that there was a place that had an answer for all the biblical questions that I had. They had a way of thinking about all of these things that actually was coherent, convincing, and biblical. And it was the only place I didn't look, it was the Roman Catholic Church. Um, for me, Marcus, and maybe this was for you too, but for me the big change was when I started to read Catholics about yeah. what Catholics believed, instead of reading Protestants telling me what Catholics believed. I found out that when I went to Catholics and found out what they believed, it was very biblical, it was very um, spiritual, and it fit reality very well. Was this an issue for you too in that it sounded like it uh, when, when you posed this to your father, I got a problem with this scripture, infallible word of God, but there's a scripture in there that I don't quite, I don't get. His answer was, well, we've got an expert coming over. Right. We've got an expert. He'll, he'll help you know. But from a Protestant standpoint, you know, whenever you have these conundrums, where do I go to get the answer? And it's almost like the door is just wide open because I can go to this expert or this expert. Or he's going to, you know, where, where does, whereas from a Catholic perspective, at least what we understand is we, we, we have the expert. Right. We have a place to go. We have a place to go that we can right. ask that question that we're called to trust because we believe Christ established this church. And so there's where the boundaries are set on, on these issues. There, there, there's a fence line around it that the right. church has said, here's, here's the safe boundaries within which you can understand that text. Right. So, you know, as, as a fundamentalist, we said that this book was our only authority. There's no authority other than this book. If you understand this book properly, it will give you everything you need to live the Christian life and to get to heaven. The problem was, is we didn't always agree about what it said. You know, for example, this verse in Colossians, what that seminary professor told me, bless his heart, he said to me, Dave, um, don't ever base your theology on an unclear verse. He said, there's some verses that are very hard to understand, they're unclear, and we can't base our theology on that. Well, I was only about 13 or 14 years old, but I looked at that verse and I thought to myself, it's not a problem of me not understanding the verse, Marcus, it's that I don't agree with the verse. <laughs> and there's a difference between understanding it and not understanding it or not agreeing with it. And... Um, and I think this is a this is an issue, you know, that of authority. Yeah. Uh, I don't have to go to this book and try to figure out every single thing and come up with a system that may disagree with the system that, that you've come up with. Because I have a church that says, here, this is what this tradition, this the Bible, the tradition, the magisterium, that's gonna guide you. Yeah. Our guest is David Curry. It, encourage you to make this clarification because I think I've heard over the years that some who watch us uh, misunderstand what we're saying. It's not that at one time you saw this book as authority, and now that you're Catholic, I've moved over here. No. 
Th this has never lost its no. authority. The scriptures no. have never lost its absolutely. authority. Absolutely. Thank you for clarifying that. No, no, absolutely not. This is inspired word of God. God breathed. The Holy Spirit breathed the words. It's infallible. We can trust everything that's in here. The only thing is, is this little mind in here can't always understand it all by myself. And uh, it's not in conflict with the tradition of the church. It's not in conflict yeah. with the magisterium. It's one authority that we were able to, 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 to take the truth. The important thing is the truth. What is the word, the revealed word of God? You're in many ways best known for your book, Born Fundamentalist, Born Again Catholic. Take a little bit and tell, tell the folk, remind the folk of how that happened. Yeah, you know, um, when I came into the church, uh, most everybody I knew thought I was crazy. They, they literally thought I had just had a mental lapse and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the pressure had finally gotten to me. <laughs> <laughs> I had, at that point, I had six children and a, a wonderful wife, and I still have those six children, and I still have that wonderful wife, but God gave us two more, so I ended up with eight. But um, my father and I had trouble talking about the issues, mm -hmm. um, and so I, because he would get angry, and, and, and I don't blame him. You know, I, uh, I was the one bringing, you know, the change into the relationship. So, I, you know, I was trying to explain this to him, and it was really, really difficult. So um, I decided to put down in writing why I did what I did. Why would this kid that had never wanted to be anything other than a fundamentalist, why would he all of a sudden decide that he wanted to be a Roman Catholic? And I wrote the, this letter. It ended up being a 220-page book. Um, I gave it to my spiritual director, Father Peter, who's been of immeasurable help to me in my, my path. And uh, I said, Father Peter, I'm just a new convert. I don't, I don't want to tell my dad something that's not true. Mm -hmm. So I said, would you just read this and tell me, hey, don't delete that chapter. Or don't say that. That's not true. Um, we don't believe that. And um, he read it. And the next time I saw him, he said, Dave, I think you need to get this published. He said, uh, I think this would help a lot of people to realize, you know, mm -hmm. another story. And so we changed it up a little bit, took some of the real personal things out of it, obviously put more of my life story into it because my dad already knew my life story. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, the publisher tells me that there's well over a quarter million people that have read the book, yeah. which uh, is uh, a grace. I just never ever, that's not yeah. why I, I was hoping one person would read that right. book. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's been a blessing. Well. Well, I'd like to ask you then a question about fundamentalism and Catholicism, which is kind of what that book's about. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember the, one of the books that helped me in the journey was Carl Keating's book on the me too, uh, on me this, too. And similar issue. You know, uh, uh, this comparison of fundamentalists and Catholics, and what we have here, there are two groups of people that, in many ways, don't understand one another, and really have very little interest on taking the time to get to understand one another. I it mean, seems like you it, You yeah. understand, it, sadly, that's the way it is, fundamentalists and Catholics. Uh, but I'm thinking even now, in the years you've become Catholic, I'm guessing you've learned to appreciate how closer they are to one another than they realize. So maybe, with, assuming we might have a Catholic out there, we might have a fundamentalist out there, talk a bit about the relationship between fundamentalists and Catholics. Well, it's interesting that in, in many ways we're trying to do the same thing. A conservative Catholic, you know, a faithful Catholic, let's call them faithful yeah. Catholic, and a faithful fundamentalist are both trying to get people to love Jesus. Yeah. That's, what we're, that's what we're trying to do, and then get people to heaven, okay? And we, we agree about so much. I mean, we start at the very most basic. We both believe in the Trinity. We believe that Jesus really was the Son of God, that he was fully man and he was fully God. We believe in that, this, that because of that, what we do with him, with that truth, is going to determine whether we go to heaven or hell after the final judgment. And we will be there forever, in either heaven 
or hell after the final judgment because of what we do with Jesus now. Uh, we believe that, uh, you know, we, we yeah. believe in miracles. This God that that's came down for us is obviously capable of miracles. He really did create the world. He really did pull the Israelites out of Egypt with miraculous um, signs and wonders. Uh, he really gave Abraham a son when Abraham couldn't have a son. Uh, he, he really uh, died. He really came to, back to life after three dead days of being stone cold dead in a grave. He did all, he founded a church. He gave his apostles the power to heal people. And he ins really inspired the, you know, the Holy Scripture. So we agree on so much. Do you even agree in the incarnation and in the, uh, uh, that he was born of Mary? Right. We believe that she was a virgin. Yeah. Now, that, that, that was a problem for me when I first came in because, you know, as Catholics, we call Mary the mother of God. Um, and that didn't ring <laughs> right in my Protestant ears, my, my fundamentalist ears, um, until I realized what Catholics meant by it. They didn't mean that Mary was the mother of the Trinity. Of course not. The Trinity has always been. But we do believe, with our fundamentals, brethren, right. that Jesus really is God. So we look at it and say, well, who is God's mother then? Mary was Jesus' mother. Jesus is God. It's a sort of a simple equation, right? <laughs> right. So uh, Mary is the mother of Jesus, who is God. Um, and when I understood that and this is sort of that thing of, of starting to read what Catholics actually believe versus what yeah. people say Catholics believe. Um, I realized that I didn't have a particular problem with that. Yes, she was the Mary, Mary was the virgin that was mother of Jesus, who was God. She's the mother of God. Uh, another fascinating thing that you reminded me of uh, when we talked briefly beforehand is that at the time that fundamentalism arose in its reason for arising, uh, Catholics were fighting the same battle. It, they didn't realize it, but if you will, you have these two groups of people fighting this, the common enemy, even though they're on the other side of the, right. uh, of the battle, they don't even see each other and realize the reason fundamentals exist because they're fighting the same battle as Catholics. Right, we're both fighting modernism, you know, um, and, and it's funny because, you know, it's like, these two sides, okay, and then they have the modernists that they're fighting, and, and we're shooting, and it's going, and we're actually hitting each other. You know? <laughs> but uh, yeah, we have so much in common. We have so much in common. Now there are differences. There are really honest differences that we have. You know, as Catholics, we've already talked about the fact that this is not the only thing that we have. It's not the mm. only thing that's necessary for salvation. And, and why do we say it's not? Because the Bible says it's not. You know, I, always, I remember I always used to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, you know, and it, where it says, uh, you know, it's, the scripture is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for instruction. And I remember realizing that that said it was profitable, not sufficient. And there's a difference. Yeah. As Catholics, we would agree with Paul when he wrote to Timothy saying, it's profitable for that. It's not all we need. You know? um, and in another letter to Timothy, uh, Paul said, the church is the pillar and ground of truth. So what is truth grounded in? What is truth held up like a pillar with? It's the church. Not against the scripture. But the church is the one that's guarding that truth. So, uh, so there are differences you know, between how we see things. Uh, but we have a tremendous amount in common, a tremendous, tremendous amount in common. Um, when you look back on your childhood faith, um, what would you say, lacking is a strong word, to say what was lacking. That's a strong comment. But because you weren't Catholic, but you were a fundamentalist believer in Christ, baptized fundamentalist, as you look back, what might you say was lacking because you weren't Catholic? Okay. You know, you've never asked me that question, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, hope I, don't, I hope I don't say something that... Uh, 
and I don't want this to come off wrong, okay? It's just you and me talking here. Okay. It, 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 Marcus, what was lacking in my life as a fundamentalist was charity. Hmm. Now, let me try to explain that, okay? We saw holiness. We were called to be holy. We, as fundamentalists, we believe we were called to be holy. As Catholics, we believe we were yeah. called to be holy. But when, as a fundamentalist, what it meant to be holy was to be separate from the world. Hmm. Okay? So, uh, we didn't drink alcohol. We didn't smoke. We didn't dance. We didn't date non-fundamentalists. And, you know, different places had different rules, but we didn't but, even... But you fundamentalists didn't have any traditions. That's right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have any uh, disciplines, right? Um, you know, those were all things that, um, that, that kept us separate, okay? And when someone fell, it, mm. there wasn't a whole lot of forgiveness. It was usually, you know, here's the door, mm. you know, because you're, 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 you're drinking. You know, now some of those things have changed over the years. You know, some of the, uh, there was a time when you couldn't do uh, mixed ba uh, swimming. You know, and, and a lot of a lot of the rules have changed. But the point is, that what we saw holiness as, was as a being separate. And let me pause here. Hold that, because you can find verses that'll defend all that. Exactly. 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 Now, as a Catholic, I remember when I came to the realization that the holiness of God is primarily love, primarily charity. And it's such an incredible charity that it can step into a publican's house and make that house holy. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a defensive holiness. It's an offensive holiness. And that's what I would say that... that the biggest thing I was like, I'm not saying the fundamentalists lack this. I lack no. an understanding of the, the powerful charity that the Holy Spirit enables his believers to change situations with their charity. You had the Bible. So why was that lacking? Why could that be lacking amongst our good separated brethren who, who love Scripture? Why might that be lacking? Well, I haven't thought about that well, question a whole lot, but you, maybe you I'll have. I'll give you my... It, it, because you can pick and choose which Scriptures you're going to emphasize. Yeah, I didn't have the church telling me, hey, you know what, here's, Reminding here's you the that big there's, picture. There's a verse in 1 John that says, you can say you love God, but if you hate your brother, you, you're a liar. Right. Yeah. If you don't have love... There's a whole chapter on that in First John <laughs> chapter right. four. Right. So you can avoid that. Right. You can avoid. You can only hear First Corinthians thirteen at weddings and think it doesn't <laughs> apply. Except, <laughs> no. Yeah. You see, you, you know that we're not faulting our separate brethren because we do the same thing. We do the same thing. Um, yeah, we do the same thing. You know, and <laughs> and uh, you know the, the the big advantage that I see that I have over when I was a fundamentalist is I have a guide the church. I have a guide. And not only does the guide just guide me, the guide feeds me. <laughs> the sacraments. Um, I, uh, if I can tell a sort of a personal story, um, not too long ago we were celebrating an anniversary and my sister was there and she's a fundamentalist still and I, we love each other a lot. Okay. Um, she's wonderful. She loves Jesus. And she's a good Christian. Okay? And she told the group as we were talking, um, and the group was mainly my kids, she said, you know, I've known Dave for longer than any of you have. And she, yeah, she's known me the whole time I've been alive. She's my older sister. <laughs> um, she said, you know, Dave is a much better Christian now than he was before he became a Catholic. And I, my, my response, it just sort of welled up, and I said, Cheryl, thank you. It's the sacrament. That grace that we get through the sacraments helps us to see these other things, helps us to try to live. And I'm by far not a perfect Catholic. I'm not trying to, I'm not, I'm not saying like, I'm not like St. Paul saying, hey, just follow in my example. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but what I am saying is, is, is the sacraments and the guidance of the church has helped. 
help me to be a little bit better Christian. And I need all the help I can get. Well, we're on the same page here. I'm gonna, I need to pause there, David. Let's pick up that when we come back, okay? Okay. All right, my friend. See you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and my guest is, is a good friend, David Curry. And uh, before we jump back into the story, I just want to remind you that if you go to our website, chnetwork.org, you'll find lots of conversion stories. And one you'll find there is David's written story is available. So you can search it and find David and many other stories, just like you're hearing tonight, to encourage you in your journey. Or maybe you have that website and you pass it on to somebody else who's considering the church, you're struggling with the journey, or maybe even struggling with whether to stay in the church because they're disturbed by things they see happening, draw them to chnetwork.org. We, we have a great staff and a, a group of online community that would love to help you grow and strengthen in your faith. So that's chnetwork.org. All right, David, I paused you there in the middle of it. I, you know, let me, let me jump onto your commercial for just a yeah. second. Um, CH... You know, the Coming Home Network has been a phenomenal help to me in my journey. You know, and I've told you this privately. I don't think I've ever said it um, on, on the, the show, but it has. Now, it wasn't in existence back when I okay. came in. It was just getting formulated. But to know that there were other people on this journey was just tremendously helpful because there was a time there where I felt very, very lonely. Very lonely. Um, so I want to say thank you. Thank you. Know, you, for you reminded me of something that I want to throw back at you in a second. But uh, when we think of the chapter six of John, the first thing that comes to our mind is he's talking about the Eucharist, right? But the whole chapter six of John, if you will, is about a winnowing down of people. Mm -hmm. it begins with the crowd. Oh, we love you, Jesus. We're gonna make you king. Well, Jesus starts saying things that they're not comfortable with. So it gets winnowed down to the leaders. They have a battle. They're not comfortable. It winnows down to the followers of Jesus. And then he has the audacity to talk about <laughs> eating his body and blood. And it gets winnowed down because they're saying this is hard stuff. So it gets winnowed down to the 12. And then it gets winnowed down to Peter. And what does Peter say? <laughs> we, we would leave if we knew anywhere else to go, basically is what he said. Yeah. You know, what you're saying is so hard, but you, you have the words, so I, we'll, we'll stick with you. But boy, you know, this is tough. Jesus. <laughs> but if, if you picture them, now they're separated from the crowd, from the leaders, from all the other disciples that have left. It's been a winnowing down. Yes. And often I've come in my old age to realize that for every one of us, following Jesus involves a winnowing down. Is that true for you? Your whole life has been, in some sense, a winnowing down in terms of yeah. a challenge to remain faithful. Yeah, and you start to realize, um, I mean, we're both closer to death than we are to birth. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, but I think both, I, I, I realize that there's a lot of things that really aren't that important anymore. You know, it really, and, and that's the winnowing, I think, that you're talking about there. Um, that. There's, I don't have that much energy left anymore. We just need to focus on what's more, more, more important. And, uh, uh, and I was thinking of it in relationship to what you said when you were talking about the Coming Home Network, that when you were making a decision of all things to become Catholic, there had been a winnowing in your life. Oh, and yeah. so the, the purpose of the Coming Home Network is to realize you're not completely alone in this. There are others right. who've gone through the same journey. But, it, but it's still all of our life were sometimes challenged, even by teachings of the church, in which we say, well, do I still agree with that? And it becomes a winnowing mm -hmm. challenge there to remain faithful right. because the devil is alive and well uh, trying to pull us away uh, to join the crowd. Right. It's easier out there. And you know, I, I, you brought something up that I think is interesting. I, I think that many times when we come into the church, we go through all the different issues, all the different doctrines, and you say, well, can I agree with this? And can I agree with this? And can I agree with this? And can I... 
it's been my experience that God asks us to take some of it on faith. For example, when I came into the church, there were several doctrines that I just didn't buy, you know? Um, and there was even more disciplines that I didn't buy. So, for example, I, I really had difficulty as a preacher's kid understanding why we had a celibate priesthood and why we had virginal nuns. I, it, it just, it, it seemed from my background to be unnatural. And I had to come into the church before, and now I have no problem with it. I'll be clear with that. I have no problem with it, but I had to come into the church and say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna accept the, the church's authority, even though this particular item seems a little odd to me. And there were a lot of the disciplines like that. For example, saying the rosary. Um, I remember saying to Father Peter, I said, Father, I, I can't see myself ever saying the rosary. I just don't see myself doing that. And he said, well, that's okay. He said, for hundreds of years, nobody said the rosary. It hadn't been invented yet. Don't worry about it. It's a discipline. It's not a part of the, the deposit of the faith. Um, but he said, I'm going to be honest with you, Dave. You can come into the church. Don't, don't worry about the rosary. But in Three years, <laughs> I guarantee you'll wonder why you ever had so much problem with the rosary. And he was right. <laughs> it, was with, it was within less than a year. Um, and I understood what the rosary was all about. You had, when we were talking about the winnowing down in John 6, and it ends, as you had said, with Peter. And uh, he makes this really powerful statement. Cause, and that's why I wanted to look to make sure I got it right. Because he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we believe we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. He, he speaks of a journey, mm -hmm. of believing and then knowing. coming to know. Yeah. It's just what you're talking about. There's a in that coming to know, a deepening of understanding is something that is a part of grace. That it's it, it's a maturing, you know, if you will. Uh, um, for you and I, it's a distilling, you know. <laughs> yeah, distilling. Yes. <laughs> you know, because for me, it was I believe that He's there in the Eucharist. Lord, help my unbelief. Yes. That other prayer that's there. I believe, but help my unbelief. So it's a it's a journey of that. I, I want to make sure we don't miss out that you would want to talk about five things that I think connect with this. Which again is that difference between how fundamentals and Catholics understand one another. Yeah, and before I do that, let me just yep, yep. let me just reiterate. I believe that my journey started at six years of age. That I really knew Jesus at that point. It it, it deepened at thirteen. It deepened as I went to seminary, yep. and I don't see wh where I am now as in opposition to how I was raised. Right. It's one journey. God was drawing me deeper and deeper into a relationship with Him. Um, but yeah, the, the, the five Ds that I, I talk about sometimes, w w it helps to explain, to, I think, to fundamentalists and to us Catholics what, what it's all about. You know, uh, the deposit, the dogma, the uh, doctrine, the disciplines, and the devotion. Now, what I found with most non-Catholics, what they have the most problem with is those devotions. <laughs> um, and that's the least important of all of those five things, you know. Uh, the deposit is what Jesus told us, what we find in Scripture. Um, I and the Father are one. The divinity of Jesus is part of the deposit. As a Catholic and as a fundamentalist, because it's in Scripture, I can't change that, and the church never wants to change that. That's the deposit. The dogma is when the councils and the Pope thinks and teaches on a certain issue, they take that deposit and they flesh it out a little yeah. bit. So it took 300 years of them to flesh out what it meant when Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And interestingly, when you study church history, you realize that a lot of that came about in some ways because the devil was trying to destroy the church by getting people to fight over the meaning of words. Right. 
They weren't yeah. supposed to, but they did, and they right. fought and over and what. Uh, and so the dogma is putting a boundary. This is right. That's what the dogma we're, does. We're here. The deposits in there, and and this is how we're going to describe that. Yeah. Yeah. And and then they had the additional problem that some of them were speaking Greek and some of them were speaking Latin. You know, I mean, it, it was just crazy. You know, yeah. um, but those are the two things that don't change ever. From now till when we get into heaven, the the posit and the dogma is going to be what we have now. Um, it's not going to change. It's not going to. We're not going to say, oh, that we were wrong about that. Uh, doctrine, on the other hand, we understand a little bit differently than than fundamentalists do. For us, doctrine is the discussion that's going on in seminaries and colleges and, and maybe even between you and me and in published works. It's the discussion about the deposit and the discussion about the dogma, trying to push the envelope and, and see yeah. what does this exactly mean? You know? now for a, Because there's of, different issues today than there were 2,000 exactly. years ago. Exactly. We're trying yeah. to apply the gospel yeah. you know, to our culture. You know? uh, now, to, to a fundamentalist, as a fundamentalist, doctrine meant something different than that. Doctrine was something that was set. It was yeah. more like dogma. Yeah. Okay? But for us, the doctrine, it can change, and that's okay. Um, and, it's, it, and we can have two people teaching it a little bit different. One of them eventually will, will you know, the church will say, well, yeah, we're going to go with this one. But in the meantime, let's, let's talk about it. And that's fine. Yeah. That's good. Um, the, and Newman would argue that the doctrines change, but they, they're always a trajectory. Right. They, yeah, exactly. They're moving in a direction. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, then after that, we have the, the, the disciplines. Now we're into a, almost a, a totally different category. Uh, the disciplines are what the church leadership, for example, my bishop, what does he say I should be doing yeah. on a daily and a weekly and a yearly basis? Um, those can, will, and should change. For example, he says that I should go to Mass every Days of Sunday. obligation. And days of obligation. Days of obligation okay. and fasting. And exactly. And so um, at first I thought, golly, you know, those rules, they get, you know, those Catholics, they have so many rules, you know. <laughs> but I realized it's just like any loving relationship. My wife and I have rules. There's certain things I don't do. Because it hurts her. Put the lid down on them. That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there's some things I should do, that, like that. Um, there's some things that, uh, that I don't say. There's some things she doesn't say. You know, there's some things that I expect her to do. And it's the same in our relationship with Jesus. The bishop says, you know what? These disciplines will help you uh, to, to, to be better with Jesus. To be, you know, uh, one of them is to go to Mass every Sunday. It's not, it's not some big horrible obligation. It's just reminding you, hey, God gave you 168 cents this week, and he expects one of them back every week. This lousy rule that I got to go to confession at least once a year. I mean, <laughs> I mean the, the value of that, excuse me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, you know the, uh, I wonder why people would only go to confession once a year. You know, m yeah. maybe they're a lot better than I am. I, I need it a lot more than once a year. <laughs> um, so th those are disciplines. Those are going to change. And that's okay. The, it, the, the bishops are going to look at the situation in the culture and say, this is what will help us to get people closer to Jesus. And then the last one is the devotions. That's where the one, ones where the Protestants, at least as I as a fundamentalist, had the most trouble with. You know, this whole idea of the, of the rosary and a lot of the prayers and, yeah. um, you know, just different things like that. Those are totally personal. And that's why my spiritual director said, it's okay if you never say the rosary, but you will. <laughs> Because uh, we can't, we can't, we don't need to worry about loving Mary too much unless we love her more than Jesus did. And I can't love Mary more than Jesus did. That's <laughs> Jesus' mother. Right. So, um, so those those devotions, those that's a personal now, decision. If you took those five D's, and you were able to to uh, talk to a fundamentalist about those in a way that you could say, well, don't you have things you could put in each of those categories? They really do. Yeah. Yeah. For us, you know, not smoking or not drinking, you know, those were, those were uh, probably we call them disciplines. You yeah. Know? Um, you, but there were rules, they that, were rules that you that yeah. you had accepted. Yeah. Uh, we were expected to be in church on You can't, I don't Sunday. think you can find a scripture in there that says don't smoke. No, no. <laughs> You can't even find one that says don't drink. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it says don't drink too much. And there are verses 
uh, yeah. promoting dancing and you know, right. with tambourines. That's you know? right. So, but these are disciplines. So you have traditions in the fundamentalists. It isn't all just thrown under the one category of right. dogma. It, there, right. there are right and devotion. You had. Right. You know, devotions, I don't yeah, now devotions is another word that means a little bit more. For them, devotions are what they do every morning. Fundamentals do it every morning with their Bible, pray, read yeah. the Bible. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful tradition. Um, it's a wonderful thing for their spiritual life. Yeah. But for us, devotions is much bigger. It's all of the things that we do personally as a personal decision to try to get closer to God. All right, we got an email. Dane from Kentucky. I grew up Catholic, but am now a Baptist after someone showed me 1 Timothy 2.5, which says we have one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus. Catholics seem to have a whole lot of mediators, the Pope, priests, in confession, Mary, the saints, and more. How do you square that with Scripture? Okay. His name is? Dane. 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 Okay. Um, Dane, I would agree with Scripture that we only have one mediator, and that mediator's name is Jesus Christ, okay? Um, but he has uh, allowed other people to help people toward God. Now, the person that helped me toward God primarily was my mother and my father. And in a way, they mediated the grace that was available only through Christ, but they mediated it to me. I'm not fully mature yet. I still need mediators. <laughs> uh, there is only one mediator, and these other people share in that mediation. Um, I've talked to many fundamentalists, for example. They say, well, why do you pray to saints? Why do you talk to dead people? And I remember my mom talking to me about that. My mom has passed along now, and she was a great Christian. And I said, you know, Mom, when your mom died, did you ever find yourself talking to her? And she said, oh, I talked to her for years. I talked to her every day after she was dead for years. I said, did you ever feel like maybe she heard you and was prompting you? He goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did. And I said, well, I, my family that I talk to is just bigger than, than just my mom, you know? <laughs> um, and that's what we really are. We're a family. There is one mediator. The man, Christ, Jesus. But he has, he's helped, he's, he's allowed other people to bring people to God too. Whenever you talk about an issue like that, there's really a lot of other issues about how we understand death and how we understand right. all those other issues. But I, I seem to remember that in the history of fundamentalism, Protestantism, if you went back to the 17th century, there was a time when the Calvinists had so influenced uh, their Christian faith that they believed that there was no need to send out missionaries because if God wanted to save those people in Africa, he'd just do it. Right. So for the longest time, there were no missionaries. Right. And then at one point, I don't remember exactly what, they, they, they recognized from Scripture that how are they going to believe unless they hear, and how are they going to, from Romans 10, right. how are they going to hear unless somebody's preaching, and how are they going to preach unless somebody's sent, and so they send out the first missionary. Excuse me, but they're intercessors. Right, they're mediators. They're mediators. We recognize, even the Protestants recognize right. that we need a mediator for the gospel to get from us to them. Right. For them to know God, we need these. They were never presuming those missionaries were gods. Right. And they didn't replace Jesus. They were sharing in what Jesus had done and, and bringing to other people. Um, I think of the many Bible studies that I was in as a, as a Protestant, and they'd be small Bible studies, and we'd share our prayer requests. And my friends would pray for things in my life, and I would pray for needs in their lives. Um, that was a mediatorship. I was, I was taking their need, and I was bringing it to God. Was I doing it in uh, isolation from Jesus? No, no, I was bringing it to Jesus for them because they were in a, in a place of need. Yeah. And that's, that's, how, that's how we we all do it. Fundamentalists do it also. I, I, um, I know so, that. I, so we, we all mediate for each other. Yeah, I know of a particular uh, fundamentalist preacher who built a big college, and at that college they got a prayer tower, 
and people are supposed to send in all their prayers, and he promised you'll take their prayers to the top of that prayer tower. Of course, you know, they, whatever. But the point is, that's mediation. Right. That's all about mediation. And we need to realize that that mediator ship is working through Christ. It's not, it's not another channel to God. Right. right. Another email, Elizabeth from Little Rock. I was raised to read the Bible, pray to the Holy Spirit, and the truth would be evident. But I can't even get the people in my Bible study to agree on what a passage means. I know there has to be a correct way to understand the Bible and wonder what you as a Catholic might say about why you think your interpretations are the correct ones. Okay. That is a very good question. Because the question of authority is, is why many of us became Catholic. Because we say as Protestants, or fundamentalists, we said, there's only one thing we need, it's the Bible. And it's evident. But the trouble was, is you and I would get in a room together and we couldn't agree about what that verse meant. And you see that in the thousands and thousands of denominations in Protestantism now. Because they can't agree on what their authority is actually saying. So who is the actual authority in that situation? I am, because I'm the one reading it, and I'm the one doing it. So what I say is, and this is what I came to the realization is, is what does the Bible itself say is the authority? Well, it certainly doesn't say I'm the authority. And it doesn't say that it is the authority. The Bible points us to the church. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the church is the pillar and ground of truth. So the truth, the true interpretation, can be found in the church. Let me throw this out at you, see if this also connects with... Another key thing that, that we recognize is that when our Lord passed the deposit of faith to the Twelve and promised He'd give them the Holy Spirit so they could remember what He said, right. that the church ever since has recognized that its primary reason for existence is the guarding of that deposit. St. Irenaeus in his book Against Heresy says that very thing. In fact, he even says the pillar and bulwark of the truth is the church. The pillar and bulwark of the church is the truth. You know, it's this, he, he, he rephrases it a little bit. So we have, and then as there were battles, the reason for the dogma was to pre preserve that deposit in the midst of storms and to preserve it and to deal with when we're dealing with new things and it has to develop a little bit. because So we have this trajectory. But what happened in Protestantism, they abandoned that history. All they've got is this left from that time period, but disconnected, if you will, from the deposit and from all those other things. I mean, when you were a Protestant, did you know much about church history? Yeah, uh, not before about 1800. I, I knew like the first Anything that was in the book of Acts, or very, very shortly after that, I, I knew that. And then there was this big, big, long span of time until about the 1800s when, I, when we picked back up with, uh, with yeah. church history. So if you had any history to interpret this as a boundary, it would have been to Calvin, or to Luther, or to the founder of yeah. your, yeah. you know, yeah. might have been someone more recent, yeah. you know, Spurgeon. Yeah, or was, something that, like that's that. who came to my mind, was Spurgeon. Yeah, it could have been Spurgeon, or Isaac Watts, or somebody yeah. like that, yeah. so... Um, we've got two minutes left in the program. Minute and a half, my friend. Um, I, I love to end this way. Let's say there's a fundamental sitting right there. What would you want to say to him about why he should make the same journey home that you've made all these years? I would say the reason to come into the church is because it truly is the place that God wants you to be. It answers the problems of Christianity, the, the authority problem, the, uh, the how do I know what's true problem. You know? But more than that, it has the sacrament. Mm -hmm. you know? It gives us nourishment for the journey. Living a charitable life is hard. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. And we need all the nourishment and encouragement that we can get. And I find that in the church. 
uh, even, even understanding charity. I have a person close in my life that once believed that allowing abortion was the most charitable thing a person could do. So, you, you know, you have to even understand, well, right. what is charity? Exactly. What I, is true charity? I, I need that guide because I have a limited amount of experience. David, my good friend. It's a joy having you back oh, on the always, program. It's good to be here. God bless you and, and all that you're doing. And, Thank you. Uh, and, you know, just, again, his book was Born to Fundamentalist, Born Again Catholic. You've got other book? Yeah. Uh, my biggest book was Rapture, The End Times uh, Error That Leaves the Bible Behind, about the whole idea of when is Jesus coming back? Yep. How do Catholics view the passages where it says Jesus is coming back? We believe he is coming back. Right. All right. All right, David, thanks a lot. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. Once again, I hope David's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you again next time.